where is the last location that you know that she was? My house. I think she's at a rehab centre. A rehab centre. Or some sort of clinic. The case of Katie Kenyon. The killer who couldn't spell. A series of texts made it appear as if Katie Kenyon was abandoning her family, only to tell a very different story because of the spelling errors and grammatical mistakes. Katie Kenyon was five foot nine with beautiful strawberry blonde hair. She is always described as a vivacious, full of life person, full of energy. The middle sister of three, Katie was born to Don Kenyon in Burnley. Burnley is a small town in northern England, and while it's known for a variety of industries encompassing manufacturing, aerospace, and technology, it is a typically historic town surrounded by beautiful nature. That's what Katie loved about this town. An outdoorsy person, she loved picnics and hikes. Working as a caretaker, Katie was a single mom to a 12-year-old girl and a 14-year-old boy. Becoming a teen mom at 19 years old, she was always a fun, responsible parent. According to her sister Sarah, Katie's nephews and nieces called her Auntie Crazy because she was one of those fun aunts that kids loved to be around. She was settled in Paddyham, East Lancashire, and was doing well for herself. She drove a white Ford Fiesta and often dropped her kids off to her mother Dawn's house for babysitting. They had a dog, Indy, who was like a third child to Katie. Lately, Katie had been struggling with anxiety and sought professional help and treatment. She updated her mother regularly, and it wasn't unusual for her to text her mother several times during the day, especially if she was going through a bad anxiety attack. It was a particularly warm spring day on April 22, 2022. Don Kenyon got an unusual text from her daughter in the afternoon. This is the bravest thing I've ever had to do. I need to find some peace and sort my mind out. So with the 6K Andy gave me to pay the debt off, I'm being free for a while until I figure all this stuff out. Don was immediately alarmed. Her gut instinct told her this wasn't Katie. She called Katie's phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Among her three daughters, Katie was closest to Dawn. She called Sarah and Jenny and told them what was going on. Katie had devoted her life to providing a stable home for her children. She could never abandon them. Her family went out looking for her. Their first stop, Katie's house. Dawn noticed her car was missing. She unlocked the door with the spare key and everything seemed normal, except there was no Katie in the house. Meanwhile, at 12.18 p.m., Katie's daughter got a text from her while she was still in school, asking about the salad she had left in the fridge. Her daughter replied that she had eaten it, prompting Katie to reply with two laughing emojis. Around 2 p.m., the girl received another series of messages from her mother, this one a bit worrisome. Hey, I love you and I'm sorry. Ring your dad. He will be looking after you for a while from today. I need to get help so I can be a better person for you and your brother. Please know I love you and I'm not upset with you. Sorry I couldn't tell you about it. If your dad won't look after you, Andy will always have your back. Remember, ring your dad or Andy. Worried, the 12-year-old texted back. Why? What about school? An hour later, she messaged her mother again, informing her that her dad was home now. Katie replied back, ring him now. Her son got an equally strange message from her Instagram account saying, Hey dude, I love you and I'm sorry you need to ring your dad. He will be looking after you from today. I need to get help. It's not you. I love you. Will you look after your sister and know Andy will always have your back? Get your dad to come and get you while I'm gone. If he won't look after you, get him to take you to Andy. The Andy that Katie is referring to is her boyfriend, Andrew Burfield. 52-year-old Burfield was a handyman from Burnley. In their relationship, Andrew exhibited a pattern of controlling behavior towards Katie. Katie experienced severe clinical anxiety, and Andrew frequently engaged in gaslighting her by dismissing her feelings as overdramatic or exaggerated. He kept putting her down, 
convincing her that she had severe mental health problems and managed to isolate her from her family. When she couldn't afford professional help, he loaned her a lot of money with a certain percentage of interest. Initially, it was £4,000, but the interest built it up to £6,000. A neighbor told the officers that Katie's anxiety had escalated since when she had found the tires of her car slashed. Katie knew it was her ex, but she didn't report this to the police. February 18, 2021. She received a high court order about the money she owed Andrew Burfield. Afraid that she would lose her home, her anxiety became severe, and she required more therapy, hence more money. She was caught in a vicious cycle. He started threatening her, sending bailiffs to her house to collect his money, intimidating her. On the other hand, each time they broke up, Andrew begged to reconnect, and they had plenty of breakups over the years. Her family knew she always said she wanted to stop him from scamming other women, and in one message, she told her mother Dawn that she feared for her life. Oddly, that very same afternoon, Katie's son got Instagram messages from Andrew, who claimed that Katie had gone to the clinic for anxiety therapy and that she had left their dog Indy with him. That was unusual for Katie. She might owe Andy money, but she wouldn't rely on him or depend on him for something as important as her dog or children. So the fact that the text kept directing her children to go to Andy, of all people. Another strange thing was that both her son and daughter had received texts with the word while misspelled, something Katie had never done before. Indy was also misspelled as I-N-D-I, and that misspelling was prevalent in Andrew's messages as well. Sarah, her sister, definitely felt this was fishy. Katie had once mentioned Andrew was dyslexic, and the messages seemed suspicious enough for Sarah to doubt Andrew. Around 5 p.m., Sarah and Jenny called Andrew to ask him if he knew anything about this. Andrew was confused as they were. He told them how he had been working all day, and that Katie had texted him around 2 p.m. earlier that day. Katie had dropped her car keys, green slip for her car, and her ATM card, probably due to the money she owed Andrew through his letterbox, then texted him that she was going to a rehabilitation clinic for treatment. She also said, I am truly sorry for everything. He told Jenny that he had just assumed Sarah had a bad bout of anxiety, so he thought nothing of it. Jenny and Sarah grew suspicious. Andrew wasn't exactly cooperating. On a hunch, Sarah decided to go to his house with her boyfriend Anthony. So from Paddyham, they set off to Burnley. When Sarah and Anthony arrived at Todd Morden Road, Burnley, at Andrew's house, Sarah spotted Katie's white Ford Fiesta. Interestingly, the name Todd Morden is often said to have come from German Todd and French Mort, both meaning death. Some say the name also means Fox's Den. And that's exactly how Sarah felt as she peeked through her sister's car's windows. This was odd. If Katie wanted to abandon her children and everyone else, why was her car parked like that? Through the windows, Sarah spotted Katie's missing handbag and some personal items on the front seat. The couple exchanged a look. They knew something was very, very wrong. They knocked on Andrew's door, but he refused to open. In an attempt to intimidate him, Anthony threatened to kick the door down, prompting Andrew to call 999. The audio transcript reads something like this. There's a guy here threatening me. He's kicking my door in. I don't know his name. He's a friend of my girlfriend. He's standing in the foyer. I'm going to barricade the door. Officers arrived at the scene at 8.22 p.m. Sarah and Anthony explained the situation and the odd messages from Katie. The officers took the case seriously because of Katie's car. They immediately filed a missing persons report there and then. Andrew cooperated with the officers as they questioned him. He told them how he had found her keys and items behind his door as she had slid them through the letterbox. Kids up from school and came on the, the keys and that were behind the door. So we came into to the keys behind the door, so she's yeah. been. When officers wanted to establish a timeline of the events, Andrew told them he had dropped his children to school at 8.30 a.m. and bought something for them, then came home at 9.15 a.m. This gave Katie about 45 minutes to drop off the keys and other items. He had then gone off to work. 
He even pulled out an iPhone 8 and showed Katie's messages, which were indeed from her phone. Now pay close attention to when the officer picks Andrew's mind about Katie's whereabouts. The way Andrew has his arms held up on his head is a subconscious move. A famous convicted YouTuber, Chris Watts, did something similar when officers showed him a surveillance video of his neighborhood around the time his wife and daughters were murdered. This is a self-comforting move that people use to self-soothe. It clears the airways and shifts the pressure off their chest. Andrew also went on to imply that Katie had texted him about going for a walk at 1.30 p.m. or so. The messages from Katie were quite clearly poorly constructed and not the way she would write ordinarily. Her messages were missing punctuations, names were spelt incorrectly, and the grammar was off. It was apparent to the officers that this was definitely not Katie. Andrew left her a series of concerned voice messages. Will you, will you please ring me? I'm a bit worried. Just ring me. You don't have to do this. I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about the money. I'm not worried about the money. Just ring me, please. Thank you. Give me a ring whenever you can. Perhaps. You don't have to be like this. We can sort it out. Whatever help you need, whatever you need from me, I'm not above anybody else. I just need to know you're safe and where you're going at all. Um, I don't want to be wrong at the dog today. Can I? Kids ring me, mate. I don't, I don't. Just, just let me know what's happening. I, I ain't got a clue. Please. I love you. Andrew agreed that this was extremely out of character for Katie. Officers cross-examined Andrew and asked the only question that made sense so far. Why didn't Andrew report all of this? If he truly was concerned, why had it taken his sister to come at his door for him to say anything at all? Andrew kept insisting that it had only just happened. Even though he had completely cooperated with the police, his body language and demeanor were extremely shady. Police were prompted to further investigate whatever he said by working with the cell phone companies. This led to another worrisome discovery. Kate's cell phone had been permanently disconnected. The next day, Jenny messaged Andrew saying, Andy, I think you know a hell of a lot more than you are letting on. I have read over the messages Katie sent to her kids, and she doesn't even spell like that or speak like that, which is what the kids have also said. Katie knows how to spell and mentioned about you having dyslexia, which makes sense to the spelling. You sent them texts. You know where Katie is. The police will trace where she was from the last message sent. Doesn't add up how she would drop her car, her keys, her bank card at yours, but no phone and none of her other bank cards. By the 23rd of April, Katie's face was plastered all over town. A missing persons post was repeatedly shared, hoping for her safe return as the posters showed images of her and numbers to be contacted. A task force of over 60 police officers was assembled to find Katie Kenyon. Further investigation of cell phone data revealed that her phone had pinged in various places, including Andrew Burfield's house. The last ping was somewhere near Gisborne Forest, roughly a 45-minute to an hour drive north of Burnley. It's a secluded spot where people go camping, hiking, or just for a picnic. Andrew's story immediately started falling apart when officers viewed the CCTV footage. Katie can be seen clearly walking into Andrew's house, kissing him outside the house just a day before on the 21st of April. Then, on the morning of the 22nd of April, she parked outside Andrew's house. Sometime around 9.20 a.m., when he claimed he was dropping his children off to school. So far, the story checks out. Until she climbs into Andrew's silver transit van. Shortly, Andrew joins her in the car. They were briefly spotted at a McDonald's drive through and were on their way again around 9.50 a.m. Surely enough, the car drives all the way up to Boland Forest, near Gibson, just over an hour's drive from Burnley. This was incredibly suspicious, since Andrew had blatantly, openly denied seeing Katie at all. Her phone kept ringing off of cell towers all the way to Boland Forest. When the truck came back, 51 minutes later, Katie was no longer in the passenger seat. 
Andrew Burfield was all alone in his truck, and yet Katie's phone continued to ping off the same towers as before. There were messages sent to and from her cell phone. Her mobile data was in sync with the CCTV footage from surveillance and traffic cameras. Was it a ghost? Obviously, it could only mean one thing. Andrew Burfield was impersonating Katie and messaging her children as well as himself. But officers had no way of pinning it on him yet. The digital trail ended at Andrew Burfield's house, where the phone was eventually switched off. Officers realized they have to act quickly in an attempt to find Katie. There was still time. Now, April is a generally warm month. It's like the beginning of summer, and it was a hot day when police decided to visit Andrew Burfield again. April 23rd, quarter to four, the police knocked at his door once more. This time, they were met with intense heat emitting from the home. On such a hot, hot day, Andrew had lit up his log burner, which is a kind of heater. It was like stepping into a furnace with the blazing log burner cranking out heat. Furthermore, he had changed his SIM from an iPhone 8 and put it into an iPhone 7. This immediately made them slap handcuffs on the man, detained on the suspicion of kidnapping Katie. There was a signal on the phone that not carry it. It's sort of a boyfriend can't carry your own girlfriend. So talk, me, talk me through these next seconds then. This has happened now. I just don't know what I'm doing, honestly. I don't know. I've covered it. I'll just go to her straight away. So following that, he then says in his interview account, wasn't it? He says he's gone back to his van. Mm -hmm. When he gets back to his van, um, he has gone in there to consider about whether or not, oh my God, I might have to kill myself take now. I'll take my own life, as you say, because I'm concerned about what's occurred. He has a bit of a reflection moment, thinks, you know what, I've not got my finances in order, um, and plus I've not brought my nail gun with me. Uh, perhaps I need to um, give myself a bit of time to get everything in order. So he then makes the decision to go back to the actual scene, which is approximately 70 meters away from the road. Mm -hmm. However, during his interrogation, he completely denied knowing anything about where she was. There was hope that Katie might still be safe and alive, somewhere in Gisborne Forest. The area was large, around 25 miles in radius, so there was a lot of ground to cover. It would really expedite things if Andrew was just honest and cooperated. Law enforcement threw everything they had at it. Helicopters, planes, heat cameras, search teams, and even cadaver dogs. Multiple search teams, including underwater search and mountain rescue units, were mobilized to scour the forest. But it was like searching for a needle in a haystack, so they turned to the public for help. On 21st April, Andrew's phone pinged at his parents' house, where he had gone to borrow a spade and a stepladder. He went to the forest of Boland, his phone disconnected for an hour, and then it switched back on. He had texted a girl he was dating that he was going to bed as he was tired from work. Andrew said he had just gone to enjoy nature. With a spade? A tip came forward, saying they'd seen a suspicious vehicle parked in an area the cops were interested in. That led them to focus their efforts. If you guys remember, Andrew Burfield worked as a builder. Employed at a specific house, one family recalled a weird conversation with him when he showed up way earlier than his usual 8.15 a.m. on Sunday morning, April the 23rd. They chatted about garbage collection, which seemed odd. He specifically asked about the bin collection schedule, and the couple dismissed it as some odd interest, probably work-related. Then, the media reported Katie missing, and they realized Andrew Burfield was Katie's ex. The light bulb went off, and instinctively, they checked their own bin. Buried underneath their garbage bags were multiple unknown bags, heavily stained with blood. There was a pair of flip-flops that looked eerily similar to the ones Katie was wearing when she disappeared. When the homeowners contacted authorities, police treated the case differently, fearing that some great harm had befallen Katie Kenyon. 
Officers had to expedite the analysis of these bags to ensure whether the blood belonged to Katie or not. Back at the station, Andrew was still being interrogated. Officers checked Andrew's iPhone Notes app and iCloud. They revealed a plethora of incriminating evidence that would help them identify the kidnapper. There were messages drafted weeks earlier in his iPhone Notes app that were claimed to be from Katie, giving instructions to her children when she wouldn't return home on April 22nd. The messages saved on the notes started on 17th of March and ended on the 4th of April. Now there was no way out and Andrew finally confessed. So we don't know what, what went wrong. You were aiming no. at the tree and... No, I can't even say I slipped, fell, I had nothing. It's, I just don't even know what went wrong. It's the stupidest thing. But I'll never do that. Something so stupid. How close was she from you? About eight feet, ten feet. There's no help there, you know, there's nothing. No. No people. No signal on the phone, they can't carry her. Can't they? So a boyfriend can't carry your own girlfriend. So talk me talk me through these next seconds then. This has happened now. I just don't know what I'm doing, honestly, God. I don't I've covered it, blood, I just go to her straight away. Mm. His story was that he was playing a game with Katie, and she put an apple on her head, betting that he wouldn't be able to hit it with his axe. He accidentally struck her, panicked, and buried her in the forest. On the other hand, officers were studying their text messages meticulously. It was obvious to them Andrew had been putting a lot of pressure on Katie to pay him back and was using the money she owed him as a way to control her. Also, the notes pointed to a pre-planned murder. In some of his eerie last messages, he says, You'll see quite soon enough, Katie. I have a way to help you. Andrew further stated that he quickly dug some ground, placed her there as they were in a remote location, and he covered her with twigs and leaves so animals wouldn't get to her. On 29th of April, police set out with the sad task of recovering her body. However, Andrew had to help officers locate her body, as he had buried her extremely professionally. There was no mound, nothing to indicate a person had been buried there. Additionally, she was somehow placed under a connection of tree roots, so one wouldn't know that the earth had been disturbed at all. Officers on site realized that Andrew had used two separate pairs of shoes to create multiple footprints, a zigzag pair and his work boots. Investigators found a spot of blood in his washing machine, and that spot was used to implicate him of the murder of Katie Kenyon. Additionally, post-mortem would reveal that Katie wasn't hit once. She was struck with the axe 12 times in May. Katie's loved ones held a beautiful funeral for her. By November 17th, Andrew Burfield was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 32 years. Katie Kenyon wanted to stop Andrew Burfield from scamming other women like he got her. In a tragic twist of fate, that is exactly what happened, although at a morbid cost. Katie's children live with her mother Dawn, and her family remembers and honors her as the loving person she was. This story also points out how important it is to recognize a toxic relationship and abuse, whether physical, emotional, or financial. If you know anyone around you that is affected by such a relationship, please ensure they get professional help.